Purgatory, Part 6 Chapter 39 Matter of Expiation Sins Against Charity Blessed Margaret Mary Two Persons of Rank and the Pains of Purgatory Several Souls Punished for Discord we have already said that divine justice is extremely severe in regard to sins against charity. Charity is, in fact, the virtue which is dearest to the heart of our divine master, and which he recommends to his disciples as that which must distinguish them in the eyes of men. By this, he says, shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another? It is, then, not astonishing that harshness towards our neighbor or and every other fault against charity should be severely punished in the other life. Of this we have several proofs, taken from the life of Blessed Margaret Mary. Quote, I learned from Sister Margaret, unquote, says Mother Greffier in her memoirs, Quote, that she w one day prayed for two persons of high rank in the world who had just died. She saw them both in purgatory. The one was condemned for several years to those sufferings, notwithstanding the great number of masses which were celebrated for her. All those prayers and suffrages were by divine justice applied to the soul belonging to some of the families of her subjects which had been ruined by their injustice and lack of charity. As nothing was left to those poor people to enact them to have prayers offered for them after their death, God compensated these poor people in the manner we have related. The other was in purgatory for as many days as she had lived years upon the earth. Our Lord made known to Sister Margaret that, among the good works which this person had performed, he had taken into special consideration the charity with which she had borne the faults of her neighbor and the pains she had taken to overcome the displeasure they had caused her. On another occasion, our Lord showed Blessed Margaret and a large number of souls in purgatory who, for not having been united with their superiors during their life, and for having had some misunderstanding with them, had been severely punished and deprived after death of the aid of the Blessed Virgin and the saints, and also of the visits of their, agent, of their angel guardians. Several of those souls were destined to remain for a long time in horrible flames. Some even among them had no other token of their predestination than that they did not hate God, Others, who had been in religion, and who during life showed little charity towards their sisters, were deprived of their suffrages, and received no assistance whatsoever. Let us add one more extract from the memoirs of Mother Graffier. Quote, it happened whilst Sister Margaret was praying for two deceased religious, that their souls were shown to her in the prisons of divine justice, but one suffered incomparably more than the other. The former regretted greatly that by her faults against mutual charity and the holy friendship that ought to remain in religious communities. She had in part deprived herself, among other punishments, of the suffrages which were offered for her by the community. She received relief only from the prayers of three or four persons of the same community for whom she had less affection, and inclination during her life. This suffering soul reproached herself also for the too great facility which she took dispensations from the rules and exercises of the community. Finally, she deplored the care which she had taken upon earth to procure for her body so many comforts and commodities. She made known at the t same time to our dear sister that, in punishment for these th three faults, she had to undergo three furious assaults of the demon during her last agony, and that each time believing herself lost, she was on the point of falling into despair, 
but the Blessed Virgin, towards whom she had borne great devotion during her life, she had been snatched three times from the claws of the enemy. Unquote. Chapter 40 Matter of Expiation Lack of Charity and Respect Towards Our Neighbor St. Louis Bertrand and the Departed Soul Asking Pardon Father Nuremberg Blessed Margaret Mary and the Benedictine Religious True charity is humble and indulgent towards others, respecting them as though they were their superiors. Her words were always friendly and full of consideration for others, having nothing of bitterness nor coldness, nothing savoring of contempt, because she is born of a heart that is meek and humble like that of Jesus. She also carefully avoids all that could disturb unity. She takes every means, makes every sacrifice to effect a reconciliation. According to the words of our Divine Master, If thou offer thy gift at the altar, and there thou remember that thy brother hath anything against thee, leave there thy offering before the altar, and go first to be reconciled to thy brother, and then coming thou shalt offer the gift. A religious, having wounded charity in regard to St. Louis Bertrand, received a terrible chastisement after death. He was plunged into the fire of purgatory, which he had to endure until he had made a satisfaction of divine justice. Nay, more, he could not be admitted to the abode of the elect until after he had accomplished an act of exterior reparation, which should serve as an example to the living. The fact is thus related in the life of the saint. When Louis Bertrand, Order of St. Dominic, resided at the convent of Valencia, there was a young religious in the community who attached too much importance to profane science. Doubtless letters and erudition have their value, but, as the Holy Ghost declares, they should yield to the fear of God and to the science of the saints. Non supertimentem dominum. There is no one above him that feareth the Lord. This science of the saints, which eternal wisdom came to teach us, consists in humility and charity. The young religious of whom we speak, while but little advanced in divine science, allowed himself to reproach Father Bertrand with his little knowledge and said to him, One can see, Father, that you are not very learned. Brother, replied the saint in meek firmness, Lucifer was very learned, and yet he was damned. The brother who had committed this fault did not think of repairing it. Nevertheless, he was not a bad religious, and some time after, falling dangerously sick, he received the last sacrament in very good dispositions and expired peacefully in the Lord. A considerable time elapsed, and meanwhile Louis was nominated prior. One day, having remained in choir after matins, the deceased appeared to him enveloped in flames, and prostrating humbly before him said, quote, Father, pardon me the offensive words which I formerly addressed to you. God will not permit me to see his face until you have pardoned my fault and offered holy mass for me. Unquote. The saint willingly forgave him, and the next morning celebrated mass for the repose of his soul. The following night, being again in choir, he saw the deceased brother reappear, but radiant with glory and going up to heaven. Father Eusebius Nuremberg, religious of the Company of Jesus, author of the beautiful book, Difference Between Time and Eternity, recited at the College of Madrid, where he died in the odor of sanctity in 1658. This servant of God, who was singularly devout among the souls of purgatory, 
was praying one day in the church of the college for a father who had recently died. The deceased, who for a long time had been a professor of theology, had proved himself to be as good a religious as he was a learned theologian. He had been distinguished for his great devotion to the Virgin, oh, Blessed Virgin, but one vice had crept in among his virtues. He was uncharitable in his words and frequently spoke of the faults of his neighbor. Now, while Father Nirenberg was recommending his soul to God, this religious appeared and revealed to him the state of his soul. He was condemned to frightful torments for having frequently spoken against charity. His tongue, the instrument of his fault, was tortured by a devouring fire. The Blessed Virgin, in, in recompense for the tender devotion which he had cherished towards her, had obtained permission for him to come and to ask for prayers. He was at the same time to serve as an example to others, that they might learn to be guarded in all their words. Father Nirenberg, having offered many prayers and penances for him, finally obtained his deliverance. The religious of whom mention is made in the life of Blessed Margaret Mary, and for whom that servant of God suffered so terribly for the space of three months, among other faults, was also punished for his sins against charity. The revelation is thus related. Blessed Margaret Mary, we read in her life, being one day before the Blessed Sacrament, suddenly saw before her a man totally enveloped in fire, the intense heat of which seemed to be about to consume herself. The wretched state in which she saw this poor soul caused her to shed tears. He was a Benedictine religious of the monastery of Cluny, to whom she had formally confessed, and who had done good to her soul by ordering her to receive Holy Communion. In reward for this service, God had permitted him to address himself to her, that he might find some alleviation in his sufferings. The poor departed asked that all she should do and suffer for the space of three months might be applied to him. This she promised, after having obtained permission. Then he told her that the principal cause of his intense suffering was for having sought his own interests before the glory of God and the good of souls, by attaching too much importance to his reputation. The second was his want of charity towards his brethren. The third, the natural affection for creatures to whom, through weakness, he had yielded, and to which he had been given expression in his spiritual intercourse with them, this being, he added, very displeasing to God. It is difficult to say all that the Blessed Sister had to suffer during the three months following. The deceased never left her. On the side where he stood she seemed all on fire, with such excruciating pain, that she could not cease to weep. Her superior, touched with compassion, ordered her penances and disciplines, because pain and suffering greatly relieved her. The torments, which the sanctity of God inflicted upon her, were insupportable. It was a specimen of the suffering endured by the poor souls. Chapter 41 Matter of Expiation Abuse of Grace, St. Magdalene de Pazzi and the Dead Religious, Blessed Margaret Mary and the Three Souls in Purgatory. There is another disorder in the soul which God punishes severely in purgatory, to wit, the abuse of grace. By this is understood the neglect to correspond to the aids which God gives us, and to the invitations which he presses upon us to the practice of virtue and to the sanctification of our souls. This grace, which he offers us, is a precious gift, which may not throw away. It is the seed of salvation and of merit. 
which is not permitted to leave unproductive. Now, this fault is committed when we do not respond with generosity to the divine invitation. I receive from God the means of giving alms. An interior voice invites me to do so. I close my heart, or I give with a miserly hand. This is an abuse of grace. I can hear Mass, assist at the sermon, frequent the sacraments. An interior voice urges me to go, but I will not give myself the trouble. This, again, is an abuse of grace. A young religious must be obedient, humble, mortified, devoted to her duties. God requires this and gives her the grace and virtue of her vocation. She does not apply herself thereto. She does not labor to overcome herself in order to cooperate with the assistance which God gives her. This is an abuse of grace. Now this sin, as we have said, is severely punished in purgatory. St. Magdalene de Pazzi tells us that one of her sisters in religion had much to suffer after death for not having on three occasions corresponded to grace. It happened that on a certain feast day she felt inclined to do some little work. It was only some simple piece of embroidery, but it was not at all necessary and could be conveniently postponed to some other time. The inspiration of grace told her to abstain from it through respect for the solemnity of the day, but she preferred to satisfy the natural inclination which she had for that work, under pretext that it was but a trifle. Another time, noticing that the observance of a certain point of the rule had been omitted, and that by making it known to her superior some good would have resulted in the community, she omitted to speak of it. The inspiration of grace told her to perform this act of charity, but human respect withheld her. A third fault was an ill-regulated attachment to her relatives in the world. As spouse of Jesus Christ, all her affections belonged to the divine spouse, but she divided her heart by being too much occupied with the members of her family. Although she knew that her conduct in this respect was defective, she did not obey the impulse of grace, nor did she labor strenuously to correct it. This sister, otherwise most edifying, died some time after, and Magdalene prayed for her with her usual fervor. Sixteen days passed, when she appeared to the saint to announce her deliverance. Magdalene expressed her astonishment that the sister had been so long in suffering. It was revealed to her that this soul had to expiate her abuse of grace in the three cases of which we had just spoken, and that these faults would have detained her longer in her torments had not God taken into consideration the more satisfying, satisfactory part of her conduct. She had abridged her sufferings on account of the faithful observance of the rule, her purity of intention, and her charity towards her sisters. Those who in this world have received more grace and more means of discharging their spiritual debts will be treated with less consideration than those who have had less opportunity of making satisfaction during life. Blessed Margaret Mary, having learned the death of three persons who had died quite recently, two religious and one secular, began immediately to pray for the repose of their souls. It was the first day of the year. Our Lord, touched by her charity, and treating her with an ineffable familiarity, deigned to appear to her, and showing her the three souls in whose fiery prisons they were languishing, said to her, My daughter, as New Year's gift, I give you the deliverance of one of these three souls, and I leave the choice to you. Which shall I release? Unquote. 
quote, Who am I, Lord? Unquote, she replied. Quote, to say who deserves the preference, deign yourself to make the choice. Unquote. Then our Lord delivered the secular, saying that he felt less in seeing religious suffer because they had more means of expiating their sins during life. Part 2. Purgatory, the Mystery of Mercy. Chapter 1. Fear and Confidence, the Mercy of God. Saint Lidwina and the Priest, Venerable Claude de Colombari. We have just considered the rigors of divine justice in the other life. They are terrific, and it is impossible to think of them without trembling. That fire, enkindled by divine justice, whose excruciating pains, compared to which all the penances of the saints, all the sufferings of the martyrs put together, are as nothing, who is there that thinks he will be able to look upon them and not shudder from the very fear. This fear is salutary, and conformable to the spirit of Jesus Christ. Our divine master desires that we should fear, and that we should fear not only hell, but also purgatory, which is a sort of mitigated hell. It is to inspire us with this holy fear that he shows us the dungeons of the Supreme Judge, whence we shall not depart until we have paid the last farthing. We may say of the fire of purgatory, which is said of hellfire, Fear ye not them that kill the body and are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him that can cast both soul and body into hell. Yet it is not the intention of our Lord that we should have an excessive and barren fear, a fear which tortures and discourages, a gloomy fear without confidence. No. He wishes that our fear should be tempered with great trust in his mercy. He desires that we should fear evil in order to prevent and avoid it. He desires that the thought of those avenging flames should stimulate us to fervor in his service and cause us to expiate our faults in this world rather than in the other. Quote, Better it is to purge away our sins and cut off our vices now, unquote, says the author of the imitation, quote, than to keep them for purgation after, hereafter. Unquote. Moreover, if, notwithstanding our endeavors to live well and to satisfy for our sins in this world, we have well-grounded fears that we should have to undergo a purgatory. We must look forward to that con contingency with unbounded confidence in God, who never fails to console those whom he purifies by his sufferings. Now, to give our fear this practical character, this counterpoise of confidence, after having contemplated purgatory and all the rigor of its pains, we must consider it under another aspect from a different point of view, that of the mercy of God, which shines forth therein no less than his justice. If God reserves terrible chastisements in the other life for the least faults, he does not inflict them without, at the same time, tempering them with clemency, and nothing shows better than the admirable admirable harmony of the divine perfection than purgatory, because the most severe justice is there exercised, together with the most ineffable mercy. If our Lord chastises those souls that are dear to him, it is in his love, according to the words, such as I love, I rebuke and chastise. With one hand he strikes, with the other he heals. He offers mercy and redemption in abundance. Quoniam apud dominum misericordiae et copioso apud eum redemptio. This infinite mercy of our Heavenly Father must be the firm foundation of our confidence, 
and after the example of the saints, we must keep it always before our eyes. The saints never lost sight of it, and it was for this reason that the fear of purgatory never deprived them of their peace and joy of the Holy Spirit. Saint Lidwina, who so well knew the frightful severity of expiatory suffering, was animated with that spirit of confidence and endeavored to inspire others with the same. One time she received a visit from a pious priest. While, whilst he was seated at her bedside, together with other virtuous persons, the conversation turned on the sufferings of the other life. Seeing in the hands of a woman a vase filled with grains of mustard seed, the priest took the occasion to remark that he trembled when thinking of the fire of purgatory. Quote, Nevertheless, unquote, he added, quote, I should be satisfied to go there for as many years as there are grains of seed in this vase. Then, at least, I should be certain of my salvation. Unquote. Quote, what do you say, Father? Unquote, replied the saint. Quote, Why so little confidence in the mercy of God? Ah, if you had a better knowledge of what purgatory is, what of what frightful torments there are endured. Unquote. Quote, Let purgatory be what it may, I persist in what I say, Unquote, he replied. Sometime after this priest died, and the same persons who had been present during this conversation with St. Ludwina, questioning the saint as to his condition in the other world, she replied, quote, The deceased is well off on account of his virtuous life, but it would be better for him had he had more confidence in the passion of Jesus Christ, and if he had taken a milder view of the subject of purgatory, unquote. In what consisted this lack of confidence which met the approval of our saint? In the opinion which this good priest had that it is almost impossible to be saved, and that we shall enter heaven only after having undergone innumerable years of torture, this idea is erroneous and contrary to Christian confidence. Our Savior came to bring peace to men of good will and to oppose upon us, as a condition of our salvation, a yoke which is sweet and a burden which is not heavy. Therefore let your will be good, and you will find peace. You will see all difficulties and terrors vanish. Good will, that is everything. Be of good will, submit to the will of God, place his holy law above all else, serve the Lord with all your heart, and he will give you such powerful assistance that you will enter paradise with astonishing facility. I could never have believed, you will say, that it was so easy to enter heaven. Again, I repeat, to effect in us this wonder of mercy, God asks on our part an upright heart a good will. Goodwill consists, properly speaking, in submitting and conforming our will to that of God, who is the rule of an all good will. This good will attains its highest perfection when we embrace the divine will as the sovereign good, even when it imposes the greatest sacrifices, the most acute suffering. O oh, admirable state, the soul thus disposed seems to lose the sensation of pain, and this because the soul is animated with the spirit of love, and, as St. Augustine says, when we love, we suffer not, or, if we suffer, we love the suffering. Venerable Claude de la Colombière, of the Society of Jesus, possessed this loving heart, this perfect will, and in his Retreat spirituale, he thus expresses his sentiments, quote, We must not cease to expiate the past disorders of our life by penance, but it must be done without anxiety, because the worst that can befall us 
when our will is good and we are submissive and obedient, is to be sent for a long time to purgatory, and we may say with good reason that this is a great evil. Do not fear purgatory, of hell I will not speak, for I should wrong the mercy of God by having the least fear of hell, although I have merited it more than all the other demons together. Purgatory I do not fear. I wish I had not deserved it, since I could not do so without displeasing God. But, as I have merited to go there, I am delighted to go, and satisfy his justice in the most rigorous manner it is possible to imagine, and that even to the day of judgment. I know that the torments there endured are horrible, but I know that they honor God and cannot prove an injury to the souls, that there are certain never to oppose the will of God, and that he shall never resent his severity, and that we shall even love the rigors of his justice, and await with patience until it shall be entirely appeased. Therefore I have given with my whole heart all my satisfactions to the souls of purgatory, even bequeath to others all the suffrages which shall be offered for me after my death, in order that God may be glorified in paradise by souls who shall have merited to be raised to a higher degree of glory than myself. Behold to what an excess of charity the love of God in our neighbor transports us when it has, it has once taken possession of the heart. It transforms, transfigures suffering in such a manner that all its bitterness is changed into sweetness. Quote, when thou shalt arrive thus far, that tribulation shall be sweet to thee, and thou shalt relish it for the love of Christ. Then think that it's well with thee, for thou hast found a paradise upon earth. Unquote. Let us therefore have great love for God great charity, and we shall have little fear of purgatory. The Holy Ghost bears testimony to the depths of our heart that, being children of God, we have no need to dread the chastisement of a father. Chapter 2 Confidence Mercy of God Toward Souls He Consoles Them St. Catherine of Genoa the brother of St. Magdalene de Pazzi. It is true that all have not attained this high degree of charity, but there is no one that cannot have confidence in the divine mercy. This mercy is infinite. It imparts peace to all souls that keep it constantly before their eyes and confide therein. Now the mercy of God is exercised with regard to purgatory in a threefold manner. 1. In consoling the souls. 2. In mitigating their sufferings. 3. In giving to ourselves a thousand means of avoiding those penal fires. In the first place, God consoles the souls in purgatory. He himself consoles them. He also consoles them through the Blessed Virgin and through the Holy Angels. He consoles the souls by inspiring them with a high degree of faith hope, and divine love, virtues which produce in them conformity to the divine will, resignation, and the most perfect patience. Quote, God, unquote, says St. Catherine of Genoa, quote, inspires the soul in purgatory with so ardent a movement of devoted love that it would be sufficient to annihilate her were she not immortal. Illumined and inflamed by that pure charity, the more she loves God, the more she detests the least stain that displeases him, the least hindrance that prevents her union with him. Thus, if she could find another purgatory, more terrible than the one to which she is condemned, that soul would plunge herself therein, impelled by the impetuosity of the love which exists between God and herself, in order that she might be sooner delivered from all that separates her from her sovereign God. Unquote. Quote, These souls, unquote, says again the same saint, 
quote, are intimately united to the will of God and so completely transformed into it that they are always satisfied with its holy ordinances. The soul in purgatory have no choice of their own. They can no longer will anything than that what God wills. They receive with perfect submission all that God gives them, and neither pleasure nor contentment nor pain can ever again make them think of themselves. St. Magdalene de Pazzi, after the death of one of her brothers, having gone to the choir to offer prayers for him, saw his soul a prey to intense suffering. Touched with compassion, she melted into tears and cried out in a piteous voice, quote, Brother, miserable and blessed at the same time, O oh, soul afflicted and yet contented, these pains are intolerable, and yet they are endured. Why are they not understood by those here below who have not the courage to carry their cross? Whilst you were in this world, my dear brother, you would not listen to my advice, and now you desire ardently that I should hear you. O oh God, equally just and merciful, comfort this brother who has served you from his infancy. Have regard to your clemency, and I beseech you and make use of your great mercy on his behalf. O oh God, most just, if he has not always been attentive to please you, at least he has not despised those who made profession of serving you with fidelity. The day on which she had that wonderful ecstasy, during which she visited the different prisons of purgatory, seeing again the soul of her brother, she said to him, quote, Poor soul, how you suffer, and nevertheless you rejoice. You burn and you are satisfied, because you know well that these sufferings must lead you to a great and unspeakable felicity. How happy shall I be, should I never have to endure greater suffering? Remain here, my dear brother, and complete your purification in peace. Chapter 3 Consolations of the Souls St. Stanislaus of Krakow and the Resuscitated Peter Miles This contentment in the midst of the most intense suffering cannot be explained otherwise than by the divine consolations which the Holy Ghost infuses into the souls of purgatory. This divine spirit, by means of hope, faith, and charity, puts them in the disposition of a sick person who has to submit to very painful treatment, but the effect to which is to restore him to perfect health. This health, this sick person suffers, but he loves his salutary suffering. The Holy Ghost, the Comforter, gives a similar contentment to the holy souls. Of this we have a striking example in Peter Miles, raised from the dead by St. Saint Stanislaus of Krakow, who preferred to return to purgatory rather than to live again upon the earth. The celebrated miracle of his resurrection happened in 1070. It is thus related in the Acta Sanctorum on May 7th. St. Stanislaus was a bishop of Krakow, when the Duke Boleslas II governed Poland. He did not neglect to remind this prince of his duties, who scandalously violated them before all his people. Boleslas was irritated by the holy liberty of the prelate, and to revenge himself he excited against him the heirs of a certain Peter Miles, who had died three years previously after having sold a piece of ground to the church of Krakow, their heirs accused the saint of having usurped the ground without having paid the owner. Stanislaus declared that he had paid for the land, but as the witnesses who should have defended him had been either bribed or intimidated, he was denounced as an usurper to the property of another and condemned to make restitution. Then, seeing that he had nothing to expect from human justice, he raised his heart to God and received a sudden inspiration. He asked for a delay of three days, 
promising to make Peter Miles appear in person that he might testify to the legal purchase and payment of the lot. They were granted to him in scorn. The saint fasted, watched, and prayed God to take up the defense of his cause. The third day, after having celebrated Holy Mass, he went out, accompanied by his clergy and many of the faithful, to the place where Peter had been interred. By his orders the grave was opened, and it contained nothing but bones. He touched them with his crozier, and in the name of him who is the resurrection and the life, he commanded the dead man to rise. Suddenly the bones became reunited, were covered with flesh, and in the sight of the stupefied people, the dead man was seen to take the bishop by the hand and walk towards the tribunal. Boleslas, with his court and an immense crowd of people, were awaiting the result with the most lively expectation. Quote, Behold Peter, unquote, said the saint to Boleslas. Quote, he comes, prince, to give testimony before you. Interrogate them. He will answer you. Unquote. It is impossible to depict the stupefaction of the duke, of his counselors, and of the whole concourse of people. Peter affirmed that he had been paid for the ground. Then, turning towards his heirs, he reproached them for having accused the pious prelate against all rights of justice. Then he exhorted them to do penance for so grievous a sin. It was thus that iniquity, which believed itself already sure of success, was confounded. Now comes the circumstance which concerns our subject, and to which we wished to refer. Wishing to complete this great miracle for the glory of God, Stanislaus proposed to the deceased that, if he desired to live a few years longer, he would obtain for him this favor from God. Peter replied that he had no such desire. He was in purgatory, but he would rather return thither immediately and endure its pains than expose himself to damnation in this terrestrial life. He entreated the saint not only to beg of God to shorten the time of his sufferings, that he might the sooner enter the abode of the blessed. After that, accompanied by the bishop and a vast multitude, Peter returned to his grave, laid himself down, his body fell to pieces and his bones resumed the same state which they had been found. We have reason to believe that the saint soon obtained the deliverance of his soul. That which is the most remarkable in this example and which should most attract our attention is that a soul from purgatory, after having experienced the most excruciating torments, prefers that state of suffering to the life of this world. And the reason which he gives for his preference is that in his, this mortal life we are exposed to the danger of being lost and incurring eternal damnation. Chapter 4. Consolations of Souls, St. Catherine de Ricci, and the Soul of a Prince. Let us relate another example of the interior consolations and mysterious contentment in which the souls experience in midst of the most excruciating sufferings. We find it in the life of St. Catherine de Ricci, a religious of the Order of St. Dominic, who died in the convent of Prato, February 2nd, 1590. This servant of God cherished so great a devotion towards the souls in purgatory that she suffered in their place on earth, which is they had to endure in the other world. Among others, she delivered from ex expiatory flames the soul of a prince and suffered the most frightful torments in his place for 40 days. This prince, whose name is not mentioned in history, in consideration, no doubt, of his family, had led a worldly life, and the saint offered many prayers, fasts, and penances that God would enlighten him as to the condition of his soul, and that he might not be condemned. God vouchsafed to hear her, and the unfortunate prince before his death gave evident proofs of a sincere conversion. He died in good sentiments and went to purgatory. Catherine learned this by the divine revelation in prayer, 
and offered herself to satisfy divine justice for that soul. Our Lord accepted the charitable exchange, received the soul of the prince into glory, and subjected Catherine to pains entirely strange to her for the space of forty days. She was seized with a malady which, according to the judgment of the physicians, was not natural, and could neither be cured nor relieved. According to the testimony of eyewitnesses, the body of the saint was covered with blisters filled with humor and inflammation, like water boiling upon the fire. This occasioned such heat that her cell was like an oven and seemed to fill with fire. It was impossible to remain there a few moments without going outside to breathe. It was evident that the flesh of the patient was boiling, and their tongue resembled a piece of red-hot metal. At intervals the inflammation ceased, and then the flesh appeared roasted, but soon the blisters rose again and sent forth the same heat. Nevertheless, in the middle of this torture, the saint did not lose the serenity of her countenance nor the peace of her soul. She seemed to rejoice in her torments. Her suffering sometimes increased to such a degree that she lost her speech for ten or twelve minutes. When her sister religious told her that she seemed to be on fire, she replied simply, Yes, without adding anything more. When they represented to her that she carried her zeal too far and that she ought not to ask of God such excessive suffering, quote, pardon me, my dear sisters, unquote, she said to them, quote, if I answer you, Jesus has so much love for souls that all we do for their salvation is infinitely agreeable to him. That is why I gladly endure any pain whatsoever it may be as well as the conversion of sinners for the deliverance of the souls detained in purgatory, unquote. The forty days having expired, Catherine returned to her ordinary state. The relations of the prince asked where his soul was. Quote, have no fear, unquote, she replied. Quote, his soul is in the enjoyment of eternal glory, unquote. It was thus known that it was for his soul that she had suffered so much. This example teaches us many things, but we have cited it to show that the greatest sufferings are not incompatible with interior peace. Our saint, while visibly enduring the pains of purgatory, enjoyed an admirable peace and a superhuman contentment. Chapter 5 Consolation of Souls, the Blessed Virgin, Revelations of St. Bridget, Father Jerome Carvalho, Blessed Rainier of Citeaux. The souls in purgatory receive also great consolation from the Blessed Virgin. Is she not the consolation of the afflicted? And what affliction can be compared to that of the poor souls? Is she not the Mother of Mercy? And it is not towards these so holy suffering souls that she must show all the mercy of her heart. She must not, therefore, be astonished that in the revelations of St. Bridget, the Queen of Heaven gives herself the beautiful name of the mother of the souls in purgatory. Quote, I am, unquote, she said to the saint, quote, the mother of all those who are in the place of expiation. My prayers mitigate the chastisements which are inflicted upon them for their faults. Unquote. On October 25, 1604, in the College of the Society of Jesus at Coimbra, Father Jerome Carvalho died in the odor of sanctity at the age of 50 years. This admirable and humble servant of God felt a lively apprehension of the sufferings of purgatory. Neither the cruel macerations which he inflicted upon himself several times every day, not counting those prompted each week by the remembrance of the Passion, nor the six hours which he devoted morning and evening to the meditation of holy subjects, seemed sufficient, in his estimation, to shield him from the chastisement which he imagined awaited for him after death. But one day the Queen of Heaven, to whom he had a tender devotion, condescended herself to console her servant by the simple assurance that 
She was a mother of mercy to her dear children in purgatory as well as to those upon the earth. Seeking later to spread this consoling doctrine, the holy man accidentally let fall in the order of his discourse these words. She told me this herself. It is related to that a great servant of Mary, blessed Renier of Citeaux, trembled at the thought of his sins and the terrible justice of God after death. In his fear, addressing himself to his great protectress, who calls herself Mother of Mercy, she was wrapped in the spirit and saw the Mother of God supplicating her son in his favor. My son, she said, deal mercifully with him in purgatory because he humbly represents of his sins. Quote, my mother, unquote, replied Jesus, quote, I place his cause in your hands, unquote, which meant to say, be it done to your client according to your desire. Blessed Renier understood with unutterable joy that Mary had obtained his exemption from purgatory 